So this is the sort of general orientation that my work comes out of. Um, and I also work with an organization that some of you might have heard of called the Long Now Foundation, which is in San Francisco. And it's um, sort of a unique cultural institution, really, in the world in terms of uh, being specifically dedicated to fostering long-term responsibility and thinking. But yeah, so today's talk um, is not about the um, specific preoccupations of, of uh, humanity plus so much as the broader structures of thought that enable us to imagine, engage in, and create possible futures. And if that sounds like gobbledygook to you at the moment, then hopefully it won't by the end of, uh, of the discussion. I want to say a word about, uh, about how I came into this line of work, because I think it might, actually, that was um, the question Adam asked me 20 seconds before I started speaking. How did you, how did you become a futurist? <laughs> Which is, um, Difficult to answer in 20 seconds, but I'll give it, I'll give it a go, just des um, describing it in short. Basically, um, my mother was a high school teacher for 30 years, and uh, when I was in high school in Brisbane, she was asked to teach uh, portions of a pilot course 
in future studies, which was being kind of tested by the Board of Senior Secondary School Studies up there. Uh, and I was at a different high school, but I came across the course reader one day at home and just became uh, extremely interested in it. I mean, I, I hadn't been aware of the existence of a field of futures studies, which is also called by some people foresight. Um, but either way, there is, at this point, about half a century of scholarship, as well as practice in parallel with that scholarship, around uh, make, enabling our thinking to be both more uh, rigorous and more imaginative than it would otherwise be in relation to the future. So I, came to, uh, I, I studied other things. I went to uni here in Melbourne. I did um, a BA LLB, so a law degree and a degree in the history and philosophy of science, which turns out to be great grounding if you're interested in the general arc of history and where ideas come from and how they translate into material change, which then feed back into the social change process. Um, and then I worked for a few years, and long story short, found that the work that, uh, that was being done in the kind of consulting sector, or at least that I was being exposed to, just didn't quite have the, the depth and rigour that, um, that I felt it could or should. And so reluctantly, it wasn't that I wanted to go back to university, but I found myself doing that anyway because I really couldn't think of a way of becoming um, a, a deeper, better futures thinker on the job. I wasn't sure that anybody actually paid for that anywhere. So I um, applied for a fellowship to the East West Centre at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, which is one of uh, a very small handful of programs in the world that offer uh, advanced degrees in future studies. Another is right here in Melbourne at uh, Swinburne University. There is a, uh, a master's program in strategic foresight. And if what I have to say to you this afternoon, indeed, actually, just if you haven't heard of it, I know there are a couple of people in the audience who know it extremely well, but if you haven't heard of this stuff, I urge you to take a look at it because it is a, um, there's, a, there's a real treasure trove of material there to deepen um, the sorts of thinking that clearly you're all interested in here by the fact of your presence. So why do this work? Well, the reason I think, um, the reason I do it is because it's, essentially I think it's, it's the most sort of um, important and useful thing that I think I can potentially contribute to. I think collectively our culture is not particularly sophisticated in its thinking about the future. Um, how many people here, and I, I know this is, a, this is an unusual audience, but let me just check. How many people here have ever done any kind of formal study of uh, the future at a university course or high school? Got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, yeah, interesting. So less than 10 people out of this group. And this is a self-selected group for people who are interested in this kind of thing. So not a particularly um, high ratio, shall we say. Um, but I, it's, it's clear that as one looks into this area that actually there are things that you can learn, there are skills uh, that you can cultivate and tools that you can pick up that do deepen your ability to engage in possibility. And, uh, and so that's, what, that's why I do the work, because I think without, the, without that um, in the cultural mix, I think we're, we're going to uh, be in for some very difficult times indeed. Um, and this is, this is a site of intervention, if you like, which holds out the promise of uh, of changing how, how adeptly our culture creates uh, its own story. And I suppose in a way you could, I mean, if you had to boil it down, the, the, uh, the central challenge of futures thinking is to uh, deepen or get away from this, this tendency that we have to think sort of in a single dimension about change. What I mean by one-dimensional thinking are the sorts of questions which come up all the time. I mean, ad nauseum, really, when, it, when, um, when we're looking at the future in sort of mainstream context, like, will X happen or won't it? Um, or these discussions about, you know, utopian versus dystopian um, outcomes. These are deeply sort of polar and binary and not particularly uh, fleshed out or grounded ways of, of thinking about change. And so I suppose what the field aims to do in general and what I'd like to try to do in specific this afternoon is add a little bit of dimensionality to how we engage the future. And I know some of you have already got, um, already have this background, but I'm coming at it from an angle that perhaps you won't have heard before. Um, and I hope it's interesting. So here's the thought. Three-dimensional foresight. 
what I have to say breaks up into three chunks, each one a different dimension of foresight thinking that I think all, all of which need to be engaged, all of which can be cultivated and thought about and deployed effectively. And the first dimension is that of difference. Now, what do I mean by difference? I mean simply the idea that the future is going to be different from the present. Starting with a very basic proposition there. I don't know if any of you have seen the, the, uh, the new movie, uh, The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. It's not a movie set in the future, it's quite amusing. But anyway, at the, towards the end of it, uh, the character played by um, Judy Dench, who sort of narrates the film through entries in her diary, says, says this, and I really like this, uh, this insight. All we know about the future is that it will be different. And it sort of resonates with another quote from my favourite writer, actually, um, that I came across a few years ago. Kurt Vonnegut, in his novel Slapstick, has one of his characters say, the his history is merely a list of surprises. It can only prepare us to be surprised yet again. And, uh, you know, there's a whole sort of, uh, there, there are lots of ways of coming at that. I'm not going to just sort of quote quotes at you all afternoon, but, uh, but, but, but the idea of the surprise of the black swan is seen to Lev's book. Um, the notion that w the, the, the future is, is primarily sort of indexed or measured in terms of what it brings that is new, that is unfamiliar, that, is, um, that has to be reckoned with or adapted to in some way, I'd say that is the first dimension of foresight thinking. And we don't need to spend a lot of time on this in this room because clearly this is a group that already gets it. That's why we're here. We're already aware that the future is going to be different from the present in some very dramatic and uh, possibly quite deep-seated ways. That's, that's the beginning of this conversation. But I think it's worth noting that there are plenty of people who um, who perhaps are less aware of that or less able to see that and to uh, imagine the future in terms of just a sort of very intensified version of the present. And uh, my mentor at the University of Hawaii, Jim Data is his name, uh, talks about the crackpot realism of the present. This idea that, that um, whatever the future brings, it's basically just going to be the same as things are now, only more so. It's, it's really a sort of extrapolative thinking that doesn't hold up um, as a historical reality, because while there might be intervals of relatively steady change along a path that you can perceive, you know, as, as uh, trends emerge and, and begin to, uh, to make themselves felt, sooner or later those are disrupted and changed, and the terms of the discussion change altogether. And it's, and it's those changes, it's those left turns, it's those surprises or differences that make all the difference. Those are the, those are the beads on the necklace of history, so to speak. So that's the first dimension, we've got it. The second dimension is that of diversity. Now what do I mean by that? I mean that in thinking about the future, we, don't, we ought not to think about it just in terms of how it might be different from today. We also need to think of it in terms of how the various ways in which it might be different from today. Now this is, a, this is a separate dimension, the reason I've sort of shown it there as a, a series of diverging lines is because in a way, since we don't know all we know about the future is that it will be different, we don't know how precisely it will be different. And when we think about it, we need to be thinking about it in terms of a range of potential outcomes. And so any single image of the future, no matter how compelling it might be, is just that a single image of the future. It's an incomplete picture of a space which is fundamentally, and by definition, multiple in its potential. So anyway, I've talked about, probably um, hammered on that point enough, but this is an image that, that a lot of people seem to find helpful in wrapping their heads around the point I'm making here about the second dimension of diversity of images of the future. It's a fairly intuitive point, really, once you look at it sort of head on. That the present moment is a moment of pure actuality and zero potential. 
There's nothing you can do about the way everything is configured right at this second. All that potential is, on the, is uh, maybe realized only going forward. Or to put it another way, if we are at the apex of this cone at the far left, as time goes on, the potential paths into our future multiply. In fact, they multiply in a, um, at a mind-bogglingly sort of exponential rate. Now, here's an example that might help. How many people here play chess? All right, a lot more people playing chess than studying futures. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's all good. So, um, in a chess game, how many uh, opening moves are there that you can make? If you're initiating, how many options do you have? Correct answer. 20, that's right. The chessboard is eight squares by eight. You have eight pawns and then eight other figures behind that. And you can move the pawns initially either one step or two, so that's 16. And then you've got your knights, two of them, and you can move them each in two directions. So that's 20. So how many potential configurations of a chessboard are there after one player each has had a turn? 400. So it's 20 times 20. So after each player has moved one piece once, there are 400 potential configurations of a chessboard. Anybody like to guess how many there are after two moves a piece? I can just tell you if you like. 72,084 is the answer. And after three moves a piece? 9 million is the answer to that one. Okay, this is a special bonus question. After four moves of piece, how many potential configurations of a chessboard are there? Each player has moved one piece just once. How many potential configurations? 288 billion plus is the answer to that. So very quickly, even in the, the confines of an eight by eight chessboard with completely knowable parameters, after four moves of piece, you've got 288 billion configurations that that could take. Now, let's think about how if we can, how that uh, exponentiality maps onto the various uh, configurations that are possible in, in life as it's lived. We're not living on a chessboard of, of 8x8 with just uh, 16 pieces to move in 20 ways initially. It's hyperdimensional. I mean, it's utterly mind-boggling, actually, how many different configurations of things can happen. And the further out in time you try to go, the more diffuse, the more numerous, the more sort of impossible to cognize, at least in specific, those various configurations become. That's the point of the, of the sort of the cone diagram here is to show, it, it really sort of reinforces what we know to be true intuitively and from our experience, that it's a lot easier to speak coherently about how things might look a month from now than how they might look a year from now, or 10 years from now, or 100. The further out we try to look, the more the noise of multiplicity gets in the way of saying something, you know, coherent about, uh, about, the, about how the world could change. Now, does that mean that it's not possible to think about the future? Bit of a leading question. No, of course it doesn't. But it does mean that we can't speak about it in, uh, that there's no possible hope of doing this computationally. So we need to do it narratively. This is how people deal with complexity, is through stories. And the term, at least in uh, the kind of scholarly strand of future studies that this kind of travels under, is the notion of images of the future. Basically, when you're talking about futures, what you're talking about are images, and we're not talking exclusively about pictorial images, but hopes, fears, expectations, narratives of all forms, forecasts in statistics, and basically any notion about the future can be rendered or sort of thought of as an image of the future. Now, to simplify a little bit, I'm going to show you some examples from a particular subset of images of the future that circulate in our culture and in our minds. And as you look at these, you might recognize the source. These are all from Hollywood films over the last uh, few decades. As you look at these, consider the fact that these are Certainly not the entirety, but a substantial sort of component of the substance of futures discourse 
that exists in the world that is available for us to dream with, for us to argue with, for us to feel with. And some of you might have, might have seen some of these films, some of you may not. The central idea here in this diversity dimension is that the, the core stuff of Future's work is images of the future. And that's, that's sort of the point of intervention, if you like, for diversifying the notions that we're able to entertain. And this is called the basic paradigm of futures, this kind of diagram here, it's from, uh, from uh, Jim Dayton, who sort of, and I, I call the, the, um, that horizontal axis kind of the content axis, if you like. So images might correspond to particular trends, to things that we see going on in the world around us and sort of playing those forward. So any given trend that, or combination of trends that you identify can, can be said to correspond to certain images of the future. And events, you know, discrete or more rapid um, happenings uh, also correspond to images of the future. And in a way, I think just as, a, as an aside, I think it's sort of interesting that trends and events can really be seen as the same thing, just on different time scales. So an event is a trend that happens really quickly, and a trend is an event that happens more slowly. So these are kind of, it's a perceptual difference, not an ontological one, if you like. And then that vertical axis, images, methods, and theories, each image can, can sort of be said to correspond to, or maybe generated or tested, but, uh, through the lens of various theories of change. So whether or not the, uh, the images of the future that we just sort of glimpsed there in uh, that sort of sampler of, of Hollywood um, screenshots, whether or not those come out of a sort of self-consciously theoretical uh, understanding of social change, they can be said to manifest theories of, of, how, of how things change. And you can bring methods to bear on them to diversify, critique, and play with those, that imagery. Okay, so we've made the point about the, the astonishing multiplicity of images of the future that are out there, and the need to, to engage the future as a space of diverse potentials. We've also made the point about the, because of that dazzling array, well, how the hell do we, how do, we do that in an orderly fashion? Well, I'm going to share with you one way that has uh, emerged in the field of future studies to, to deal with that, um, with that plurality. And this, uh, this is called the four archetypes or generic images of the future. And the central idea here is that in the same way that, uh, that the narratives, the specific stories that are told on stage in plays or in novels or comic books or movies or TV, there's any number of specific stories that can be told, but there's a finite number of basic plots. This is something that literary analysts have noted for, noticed for a long time. And you can make the same kind of argument with respect to ideas about the future, that there's any number of variations, but there's only a finite number of themes or general images, archetypes of, of, uh, of, of social change, if you like. And those are as follows. Stories about growth, about continued uh, growth, consumption, production, population. That example is from Minority Report, you can see there. Stories of collapse, about the social fabric tearing apart, about the, the bottom falling out of the economy, about the, the basic assumptions of continuity of life somehow being torn asunder. Those are collapse stories. These are sets of narratives. The third one is discipline. Now, discipline stories can be uh, based on a sort of spontaneous adherence on the part of a group to a particular set of mores or um, pursuit of particular outcomes, as in, say, an attentional community like a kibbutz. Or it could be imposed from above in a more totalitarian fashion. That image is from the movie Gattaca. But either way, those are flavors, you might say, of disciplined society or disciplined narrative of the future. 
And then the fourth one is transformation. And that, that transform can take a couple of different uh, forms as well. One of them is religious. So the idea um, of, of a second coming, of some kind of you know, day of reckoning in the Judeo-Christian tradition, that is a, uh, arguably a transform scenario that goes back a long way in our cultural DNA. But another variant of that transformation might be a technological one, wherein you know, our minds become uploadable onto some other kind of substrate than what they currently, you know, than the flesh they, they sit on now. Um, and this variant, this sort of technologically driven transformation, I think will be uh, very familiar to people in this room. So those are the four kind of images of the future, four generic sets of images that you can think with. Now, if we revisit those stories that we saw a moment ago, you could say that a movie like Minority Report, or Back to the Future Part 2, or Simone, or 2001 A Space Odyssey could loosely be said to be continuation stories. Whereas The Day After Tomorrow, Mad Max, Children of Men, The Road, these are variations on the theme of collapse. This film, which I just saw on Friday, The Hunger Games, I would say is uh, probably best characterized as a disciplined society, as would be 1984, Fahrenheit 451, Gattaca, and then in Transformation, a film like The Matrix, or Tron, this is from Tron Legacy. And then, look, I don't, I don't mean to say that any given image can be slotted neatly into a category and that solves the problem. These are just tools with which to think. So, you know, there are, um, there are variations. And I see I'm going to need some uh, battery power. My, my, uh, can somebody help me plug my computer in? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Brilliant. A little bit of discipline uh, in order not to collapse during the presentation. Um, I was just making the point that um, these are not intended to be um, mutually exclusive categories that sort of somehow do away with the complexity of uh, a nuance of the images of the future that we find or that we create. They're like any theory, they are a simplification you know, that can be heuristically useful in, th in thinking in, about uh, categorizing or characterizing uh, the, the future scape, the, the landscape of ideas about the future. And so, for instance, you know, the matrix in some ways could be said to be partly a transformation story, but it's also partly a discipline story because it's about humanity being enslaved by uh, machine intelligence. Um, or Blade Runner could be said to be um, partly a uh, continuation story because it's you know uh, definitely recognizable in terms of um, the uh, the continued growth of a number of technological strands there but there's also a transformation element to it in the form of uh, of uh, replicants and um, artificial intelligences and then a movie like rollerball is sort of a combination of continued growth and discipline because it's about you know or it's set against the backdrop of of corporate um, corporate statehood. You could say the same thing about uh, Robocop or Starship Troopers. These are sort of hybrid stories that exhibit characteristics um, of several of those categories. The point being, though, that you don't have to use them, or you, don't, you can use them to classify scenarios, but you can also use them to generate scenarios, material to think with, diversification of the, of the array of images of the future at your disposal. Okay, so that's so much for um, a little more time on this one because I think it's uh, in some ways the most challenging and for me it's really where the rubber hits the road um, in, in current practice and emerging futures practice. The third dimension is depth. So if difference is about understanding the future as a different place, space, topia from the present and the past, and diversity is about understanding the array of potentials that time uh, contains as it unfolds only through one path. It's, it's, 
instantiating that path from among many possibilities. The third dimension is about really understanding the what the lived qualities of these hypothetical worlds actually are. So the reason I think depth is important is because the futures field has existed for about half a century, as I said, and there's a whole array of, of tools at one's disposal if you want to be a professional futurist or if you just want to dabble with it. There's a whole lot of things you can do, but the forms that, that, uh, that those engagements typically take are not themselves, by and large, particularly futuristic. So this is, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with this as a uh, with the image you're seeing here as a kind of example of a futures workshop. In fact, I'm sure it was great. And there's nothing necessarily intrinsically wrong with the output of uh, reams of scenario papers that, you know, or reports about future possibilities. Nothing wrong with it in itself, except that those traditional tools, I would argue, aren't working. If by working we mean really transforming uh, how, we, how we think about and act into the future. And I'll give you just one example, there are many, but I'll give you one that, sh that I think dramatizes the point about depth because it includes the other two dimensions, difference and diversity but lacks depth. So this is an image from, um, I'm sure you're familiar with the International Panel on Climate Change. It's the world's peak body um, for climate change science. Um, about 10 years ago, they produced a series of scenarios for climate change 100 years out. And um, it's not a particularly sort of thrilling read, but there is a, a, uh, a summary document which is the, those scenarios rendered for policy makers, right? So this is a shorter document, which is intended to engage the world's decision makers in thinking about and understanding how climate change could play out over the next century. That's the purpose of the document. Now this is one of the kind of centerpiece uh, elements of that document. These four charts are showing potential changes in uh, global carbon dioxide over four different sort of sets of assumptions about the world. Now, each of them engages with difference. Look, there's a time, timeline down the bottom going all the way out to 2100. And it engages in diversity. Look, there's four of them. So they're not just saying there's one thing. And in fact, even within each, there's a sort of um, you know, sensitivity analysis. You can see from the, from the uh, thickness of the, of the colored lines what the range is that they're sort of willing to entertain within each of those scenarios. <coughs> And this is what the textual counterpart in that same document looks like to uh, the textual counterpart to those uh, statistical charts. And this is what the world's leaders are using as a basis for thinking about the next century of climate change, which bears no frigging resemblance whatsoever to what life feels like as lived. Like in Brisbane last year, when the Brisbane River flooded, or in New Orleans, Louisiana, seven years ago now, when the levees broke uh, during Hurricane Katrina. So we have this, I would say, massive disconnect. This is also from New Orleans. And it's tragic and heartbreaking and devastating and it has absolutely no relation, it would seem, to the ways that we are depicting, thinking through these futures for ourselves. Now, I'm not suggesting that Brisbane or, or uh, New Orleans are instances of climate change. That's not the point. The point is that those are the sorts of events on the ground, the sorts of lived experience that are at stake in whether or not we deal with climate change as an issue at scale. And nothing along those lines is being invoked into the discussion, being sort of brought into the understanding to get us to feel what the stakes might be in making the decision between these various pathways. That's my point. And so this disconnect between how futures are typically imagined and how life is typically lived and what it feels like to be there when you're living it is a serious problem 
I don't think it's a problem just for the field. I think it's a problem for humanity. I think it's something that we need to deal with urgently. And I call this the experiential gulf, the difference between the way we represent futures to ourselves um, for official purposes and, and uh, how life feels. So what can we do about this? Well, I think we can uh, aim to bring futures to life. I think we can breathe life, breathe uh, detail and depth and feeling and uh, visceral insight, or at least the potential for those things, into the conversation by translating the ideas, these sort of scenaric propositions, into experiences that people have that feel more like those futures would actually feel to live in. And I call those things experiential scenarios. And so now I want to show you a series of examples that begin to get at what this changed approach to uh, immersing ourselves in futures possibilities, what that may look like. So this first example is from the, uh, from the state of Hawaii where in 2005 I arrived to do my um, Masters in Futures Studies and a few months after that it happened that the state, uh, the state legislature approached us at the Hawaii Research Center for Futures Studies, it's kind of the um, uh, consulting wing of the graduate of the postgrad program there. They approached us and said that they wanted to convene a public conversation about Hawaii, the islands, in the year 2050 and could we help? And so, long story short, what we did was, for the kickoff to that event, we immersed 550 people who attended the kickoff in four different rooms, and in each room was a window on a different version of the year 2050. So, the first room was a live debate on stage, not unlike this one, between two candidates in the uh, election for governor in the year 2050 and the candidates were both corporations uh, because legal personhood for corporations had been extended to the point where they were now running for office, winning regularly, squeezing out um, flesh and blood individuals, but represented by sort of human, interchangeable human avatars who could speak on, on the part of those corporate organizations. The, um, the incumbent candidate was called Aloha Nuclear and Water. And in this version of 2050, they had solved many of Hawaii's um, resource issues, which in 2005, just to speak about the reality um, of, the, of the time when we staged this for a moment, included 90% uh, of the food in the islands that was consumed was imported, and 95% of the electricity uh, in Hawaii was produced by burning oil, which Hawaii does not have any of uh, on its own. It's imported on oil burning tankers. Um, and so that was the reality, um, the backdrop for this discussion of 2050. And in this 2050, those problems had been addressed through the uh, importation of small amounts of nuclear fuel, which powered a, um, a nuclear station on the island of Oahu, and also a, um, a nuclear powered a desalination plant for drinking water and enabled the population to continue to grow consumption production um, to, uh, to grow unabated and so forth. The experience that people had in the room though was of watching the candidates present their case, then interacting with them, asking them questions about their policies. We workshop this with, uh, with a troop of uh, improv actors. So they knew the world that they were operating within and could um, speak spontaneously from inside. And meanwhile, in the second room, people were being ushered into rows by uniformed guards wearing what looked like camouflage gear. But at a second glance, you realize that it wasn't camo gear, it was, uh, or it was, it, that the camo was actually um, aloha print material, so hibiscuses and ferns, but in camouflage colors. And people watched a 10 minute essentially propaganda video about the history of the Hawaiian Islands from prior to European contact until 2050, which explained that there had been a global economic meltdown, not a, not a downturn or a 
or a temporary crisis, but a, um, a serious collapse, um, which precipitated the departure from the islands of those who could afford to, um, but the rump of the US military, which in 2005, as today, and in this, uh, this version of 2050, the US military has a significant presence on the islands, and they step up to maintain law and order, to ration fuel and, uh, and food and those sorts of resources. And of course, they're so effective at doing this that they see no reason to step back down again. But what they do do is reinstate the Hawaiian monarchy, which was deposed in 1893 by, by America. And so the people in the room who are, who are shown here swearing a solemn oath of allegiance to the democratic kingdom of Hawaii and the king and his officers. That was room number two. In room number three, people walked in and they were given to understand that somewhat like jury duty, uh, their names had been selected at random and they had an obligation to attend the Honolulu Apu Pua'a Civic Education Center. Now these are all site and culture specific, so the Hawaiian audiences knew that Apu Pua'a is actually the uh, it's a traditional unit of governance, which is also the watershed. So, in traditionally prior to European contact in Hawaii, the, uh, the political unit, the community unit, was um, coincided with the, um, with, the, with the boundaries of the ecological unit. And this was also the case in this version of 2050, and so people were in the room at the Civic Education Center getting a, a compulsory crash course in sustainability skills, like making clothing out of hemp and uh, growing algae to turn into biofuel. And so the fourth and final room we imagined as kind of a cross between um, a hospital emergency room and an automotive uh, body shop. And it was called Embed, the Mind Body Enhancement Depot. And so these guys in white lab coats came out and explained to the assembled group that the World Council had been monitoring the Global Happiness Index and pre-mods were dragging down the averages. So everybody in the room, you know, uh, pretty conventional, standard issue, flesh and blood humans, um, was part of an underclass that was being given a helping hand by the World Council, and so they stepped through a series of uh, uh, options for me basically menu items for the, um, bodily and mental augmentations that were available to them. Uh, for free or at significantly discounted rates. So for instance, you could get chlorophyll therapy, which would turn your skin green, but enable you to photosynthesize so you didn't have to eat very much. Um, there was a, a, a product called the ProMinder Learning System, which once installed would enable you to, uh, to instantly download any of thousands of skill sets and bodies of knowledge um, to which you'd have instant access. So some of you may have noticed that, uh, that those, those stories are each based on one of, the, uh, one of those images of the future, the sets of, of scenarios that we talked about a few minutes ago. There's the continued story, the collapse one, the discipline one, and the transformation. And the point was not that any of these were predicting what would happen, but they were concretizing a specific hypothesis about how change might pan out, giving people a chance to think with it, to feel with it, and argue with it if they wanted. And after these experiences, they were led into a facilitated discussion about what they liked or didn't like about the future they'd just been in, about what they um, felt was ridiculous or chillingly plausible about the future they'd just been in. And, most importantly of all, what it meant, what it imported, what it boiled down to for the actions they should take next to make those things that they wanted to see happen more likely, and those things that they did not want to see happen, less likely. And this uh, experiment in experiential scenarios led to a whole series of others. And, uh, I did these in collaboration with, um, with a very good friend and uh, long-standing colleague, Jack Dunnigan, who's now at Institute for the Future in Palo Alto. But we created these things called found futures, which are artifacts that we would then distribute in the environment for people to uh, stumble across in the course of their everyday lives as a sort of optional invitation to think a little more deeply about various future possibilities. We created sets of postcards from Hawaii in the year 2036 and sent them to 
um, to leaders and community figures around the islands to their home addresses where we could get them. So they would arrive Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in the morning mail um, without any explanation as to where they came from or any particular um, follow-up action required just as a go to think about what various futures could feel like to inhabit by distilling them down to a fragment that they could then experience and encounter in the flesh. And then we did a series of installations in Chinatown, which for my money is the most interesting neighborhood in the islands. Um, it's uh, certainly one of the oldest urban um, groupings um, in, in Hawaii. And Jake and I did a, basically um, a sort of semi-structured ethnographic research process where we interviewed um, residents and proprietors of businesses in the area and found out the sorts of things that they were thinking about, concerned about, but that were not being explicitly addressed in any formal you know, political or, uh, or community process. And then we dramatized stories that contained those seeds for people to come across them in the course of their lunch hour or what have you. So this was from an installation of, uh, which was dramatizing a gentrification of Chinatown. So this, this uh, corner block um, had been empty for three years and suddenly Starbucks was opening there. Well, actually it wasn't, but that's what we made it look like. TGI Fridays, which is a, um, a fairly generic sort of um, family restaurant chain, was opening up down the street, and meanwhile, luxury lofts were uh, about to be auctioned off, starting at $2.1 million. All of this in a neighborhood which has never been touched by, uh, by um, national US chains um, of re retail or restaurants or anything. Um, but which seemed to be imminent because, you know, there were... In fact, this was staged during a um, first Friday art walk when the streets were pedestrianised and all of these elements were kind of um, synchronised to sort of show up at once as people walked around so that they would be um, immersed in, in, a, in, a, in a sense that the neighbourhood had suddenly changed or was changing before their eyes. And in order to sort of take the drama a little further, we also staged the other side of the story, which was holding a Save Chinatown rally outside the, the ostensible Starbucks to be. Um, and this, uh, this story found its way onto uh, the front page of the state newspaper the following week because a number of people, um, uh, including the director of planning for the city and county, uh, believed that it was actually happening and thought that the proper permits hadn't been um, secured. <laughs> there were other stories as well, I won't go into, into as much detail on these. Um, this was a, this, this uh, scenario was called Green Dragon, and the, the, the um, central question was, what becomes of Chinatowns in a world where China is the geopolitical superpower rather than the United States? They could sort of become you know, embassies of soft power for China, and if the US's fortunes continue to uh, were, were to wane, say, um, a couple of decades away, then China might become a very attractive bigger brother, sort of a sponsor um, for Hawaiian independence um, than the United States has proven to be. And this, again, I, I uh, hasten to reiterate, it's, it's culture and site specific. So uh, this, is, this sort of icon which we created was, is, um, immediately intelligible to Hawaiian residents, but it's Sun Yat-sen, the Chinese revolutionary, who went to school in Honolulu, and Queen Lili Uokalani, who was the last Hawaiian monarch uh, before the, um, the overthrow in 1893, both holding up a, um, a torch together on the Statue of Harmony, which is a gift from the Chinese government to the people of Hawaii in the year 2026. And that found its way, we drop lifted it into souvenir stores alongside <laughs> other souvenirs. And the third story was about a bird flu outbreak. This was uh, two or three years before swine flu. But um, Chinatown in its history has been um, burned to the ground, not once, but twice, as a result of uh, plague outbreaks um, at the turn of the 20th century. And so we thought that the concern um, in, the, in the wider media about um, a, a bird flu, well, as it, as it was, a bird flu uh, pandemic could be centered around this location 
as, the, as a sort of epicenter. And so we told that story through a series of artifacts produced as if that history had happened and spun off you know, the detritus of that, of that history which we manifested to tell that story. So this is an ambulance chasing lawyer saying you may be entitled to compensation for wrongful quarantine or property destroyed due to consideration. This is an ad from Maui, a neighboring island to Oahu saying, come visit Maui, it's beautiful over here, but over there they're using, they're using gas masks because Maui wasn't affected by the, by the outbreak in this story. And then there were more obvious elements like this, which we had to handle very carefully. So that's why it says, in case of secondary outbreak, uh, you know, rather than bird flu in progress, freak out and run across the road and sue us, we really didn't want that to happen. And I think probably my favorite artifact from this installation, or this series, was a bronze plaque commemorating the bird flu outbreak, as you can see from that sequence I just showed you, which is a fraction of what was produced. The bronze plaque has a gravitas about it that print material doesn't. And this sort of, in a way, is the point, that if you can take these ideas about the future and manifest them in a way that asserts it as a potential reality in material media, in performative media, then you get a lot closer to a, to a lived sense of what it would be like to be in that world, to be in that situation, which, after all, is what future thinking is you know, really supposed to be about. And we've done other things too, like uh, staged a, uh, a eulogy for um, Eddie Adams, aka Dirk Diggler, from Boogie Nights at South by Southwest in 2008. Um, it turns out that after Boogie Nights, the movie ends in about 19, uh, 70, 1985. Um, but through the year 2025, Dirk Diggler becomes a hero of the copy fight movement because one way or another he inadvertently sold the rights to his enormous appendage to a company that produces marital aids. And, uh, and anyway, there's a long story behind that. But, uh, um, but these are you know, instances of the, the ways in which various futures, some of them more serious than others, um, can be dramatized and brought to life. This is from a, um, from a version of Hawaii that has been closed to the outside world for most of the 21st century, and it's the first exhibit of artifacts that have been seen by the outside since that time. And so you see the installed base of industrial civilization having been reworked and used, at, you know, sort of picked over and turned, into other, turned to other purposes. So that last one, for example, is a, is a wind-up solar-powered um, cell phone and this is a wok made out of a hubcap from Honda, I think. This was a project, Superstruct, which some of you may have heard of. I, didn't, um, I was a game master on, on that, which is, a, is the world's first, it was billed as the world's first massively multiplayer forecasting game. And 7,000 people imagined themselves in the year 2019 and played the role of, of, of themselves facing this sort of hypothetical disaster, which it was the object of the game, to overcome by ideating, brainstorming, and telling stories together about how those problems are solved. And then there are other installations. This one is about um, dramatizing the history of plastic over the last 100 years. This was installed in the California Academy of Sciences on the occasion of Jacques Cousteau's um, 100th birthday, or what would have been his 100th birthday, um, to show that the production of plastic is on, a, on an exponential curve where other things being equal, um, as much plastic would be produced between 2010, when we did this, and 2030, as had been produced in the previous 100 years, i.e. the first 100 years of plastic um, as a set of materials. And so while this isn't so much about um, uh, dramatizing a, a scripted story, it's sort of about creating a story by, um, by embedding those ideas in a situation, in an encounter with physical things. These were um, uh, these water coolers, glass and, uh, and porcelain water coolers, were what people were able to drink out of um, at the celebration for the 100th birthday of, of Cousteau. And of course, nobody wanted to drink out of 2030. They all drank out of 1960 or 1910 if they knew what was good for them. Um, and there are other examples which are, 
really, you know, I don't need to, to walk you through all of these, but um, this is from a, um, from a class that uh, Jake and I ran at California College of the Arts. It was called Strategic Foresight and Tactical Media, and it was basically about having the students create their own uh, narratives of the future and turn them into an encounter. Uh, in this case, they uh, created a, a, this, this group pictured here, created a, a, a genetic census in the year uh, 2020 and went around in lab coats inviting people to swab their mouths um, in exchange for what they were told would be a sort of full genetic profile. It's kind of interesting because, again, as with the, with the first Chinatown installation that I showed you, there was some ambiguity as to uh, whether it was manifesting a possible future or actually happening in the present, which was a, I think, you know, a deliberate ambivalence uh, on their part. The point of all this is that futures studies, if done right, is what Ashish Nandi, one of uh, India's top public intellectuals, calls a game of dissenting visions. I really like this phrase. I like the idea that, um, that the conversation that we, uh, that we have about the future is deliberately oriented to surprising ourselves um, to stretching the bounds of our imaginations and um, uh, and dissenting with the dominant uh, d dissenting from the dominant ideas about the future, which um, those in power would ha would have us accept unquestioningly. Each scenario, and this is true not just of experiential scenarios, but of scenarios in general. Each scenario is quite deliberately a different vantage point from which to view and critique the present. And so, in a way, if you sort of We've, we've now looked at these three uh, dimensions of foresight, um, difference, diversity, and depth. But if we can sort of think about where, where this is pointing, what the ideal is for, um, for this whole strand of work, I'd say that in some ways, it, well, it might take us back to some classic science fiction. In some ways, the ideal for future's work is time travel is the idea of being able to create a vehicle for visiting and learning lessons from the various environments that we could find ourselves in 10, 20, 50, however many years out. But the difficulty with the conventional notion of time travel, I think, is that it, it, it does contain that assumption which we started out kind of deliberately critiquing and departing from in this talk and in the field in general, which is the assumption of linearity. I couldn't find a picture of it, but, um, but uh, the last, when you see time machines depicted in science fiction, they've always got a sort of throttle that just uh, takes you forward, or maybe you know, in some stories you can go back in time as well. And this plays into the shibboleth, you know, the completely unsustainable, I think, um, uh, premise of a linear, historical process, which only goes one way through the one path. And then, you know, if that, if that were the case, then the central problem would just be to try to figure out what the future's going to be and then make it happen faster. And I think, fundamentally, that doesn't hold up uh, as a philosophical starting point. Another um, ideal that we could think with uh, comes from that fabulous um, font of, uh, of criticism and humour about our, our future-oriented discourse, Futurama. And uh, in a couple of episodes, there's this hypothetical um, device called the what-if machine, which Professor Farnsworth invents or finds somewhere. And uh, the what-if machine, when you ask it a question about, you know, what if, <laughs> what could happen, it shows you, um, and in, in the sort of the parameters of the story, you then, you know, the rest of the episode is kind of taken up with showing you, uh, with, with telling that story. But see, both the time machine, whether it's you know an H.G. Wells time machine or a DeLorean from Back to the Future, and the uh, and the What If machine from Futurama, they deal with they actually um, they deal with depth because they tell these science fictional stories really well, but they lack that, and they, they also deal with difference because they're you know like us motivated by this question of how can the future be different from the present. But what they lack is that systematic engagement with diversity, with the range of possible worlds that you can find yourself in. Find yourself in. And so, as we wrap, wrap this, uh, 
wrap this up, I'm, I'm thinking of the, of the quote which um, Adam introduced during his talk yesterday from Kevin Kelly, which is, um, I think, from, the te from uh, What Technology Wants. And he said, the mind is a choice factory. Um, and I like that. I think that's sort of a neat, um, it's, a, it's a neat sort of orthogonal view on what our brains do. But I'd say that traditional cultures are in many ways inevitability engines. They, so they provide meaning. Um, and you know certain structures and expectations for our behaviors, but they also, by and large, hem in our sense of that plurality. And so what's called for is a different kind of time machine than the ones we've been uh, looking at here. And I'd say that the time machine that we need is actually right here. It is, uh, if, it, it, is uh, it is our minds, and it is the way that we, um, that we manifest these stories and show them to each other. And, and so, the time machine is not a vehicle that we need to get into, but a set of skills that we uh, can actually cultivate, um, both individually and, uh, and as communities. Structures for exercising and externalizing imagination so that we can co-create together. And so I'd say the quality of our conversation, and therefore the quality of our decisions vis-a-vis -vis the future, depend on the qualities of imagination that we manifest. And the, the projects that I've shown you are just a, sort of very modest and, and, and very crude, I think, sort of beginnings of, a, of, a, of an emerging practice of experiential scenarios which are intended to do exactly that, to sort of externalize um, in a way that conserves a shared experience, a virtual shared experience of potential, and therefore a basis for, uh, for deeper, you know, a, a deeper a collective process around choosing among possibilities. So the three dimensions that I've introduced um, as 3D foresight, difference, diversity, and depth, all of these enable the fourth D, which I'll tell you what it is in a minute. But first, this um, variant on that, on that cone of possibility, for the last 40 years or so, there has in futures practice been a um, a trio of terms that are that have been taken up by by a great many practicing futurists that are really useful for talking for, for clarifying which kind of conversation it is that you're trying to have about the future. There's the possible future, and in our cone sort of uh, diagram metaphor here, that would be the bounds of the cone, the bounds of possibility. There's the probable future, which is a subset and an ever-changing subset of that uh, cone of, of uh, possibility. And then there's the preferable future. And each of those dimensions is a different kind of conversation. And it's often unclear, I think, because we don't have a, um, a particularly sort of sophisticated, shared uh, futures literacy, if I can put it that way. It's often unclear when we're talking about the future in, in public discourse, which of those categories we're talking about. And so there's a tendency, I think, for, um, for the probable future to be the one that everybody wants to talk about. And, you know, I get asked all the time, um, because I self-identify as a futurist, uh, well, then what's going to happen? And the point to me is not to answer that question, but to turn it back to, you know, to, to all of us as a collective and say, well, what could happen? What do we want to happen? And to borrow again from, from uh, a trio of questions that, uh, that Adam introduced in his talk yesterday, um, there was, what do we want? What can we want? And what should we want? But what's missing from those three is the question, what could we want? Which is the mapping of that diverse array of possibilities from which we can then choose more wisely the what should we want. So I think the purpose of this whole discourse, if I, if I can take it at that sort of broad level, the purpose of this whole discourse is to merge the probable future with the preferable one, to make more likely the future that we want to see happen. And so the fourth D, after difference, diversity, and depth, is design. The future cannot be studied because the future does not exist, is data's first law of the future. And as I've said throughout this talk, um, what we're really discussing 
are the variety and quality of images of the future that we carry around and that, we, uh, that inform our action. Future, the future is not a thing out there to be discovered the way we, we um, examine you know, geological specimens and, and carry out our science. It's a dimension of awareness in the present. It is made up of stories. And so an intervention in the substance of images is an intervention in our collective thought process in the way that Stellark was suggesting by invoking Wittgenstein earlier today. What we're talking about is thought happening by dramatizing possible futures in our environment and thinking with them and feeling with those possibilities to a more um, informed decision process about where we want to go. And that means we are co-designing possibilities and bringing the best of them into live reality. So design is the fourth dimension of foresight. Thank you. who's interested in uh, moving into uh, futurism and uh, strategic foresight, uh, given that strategic foresight is a postgraduate, what do you think is an appropriate foundation? How does a futurist get started? At least here in Melbourne, considering the best requires an undergraduate. Yeah, it, it, it almost doesn't matter. Um, you can come to it from basically any disciplinary background and the more important thing is, I would say, to read into the, into the field and find out what else has been done so that you can actually build the bridge from your own disciplinary starting point into, um, uh, you know, into, into a study of futures. But, uh, you know, I'm not credentialist about this. I don't think you necessarily have to do a degree in it. Um, I do think that, that it behooves anyone who um, wants to call themselves a futurist to know about the history of the field, to, to build on what comes before instead of you know, pretending to reinvent it, which happens so often that it's, it's mind-boggling. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean getting a credential in it. I'm not trying to talk about that, I'm just saying I think there are a lot of ways to come at this. And the more important thing you know, to echo an earlier speaker is to, uh, is to sort of follow your passion, um, which I'm sure will include other things you know, that are more specific, less transdisciplinary and messy than futures. Um, so I think we've got a, a 15 minute break, break. but um, what, I, what I can do, I think, because I, I think one question really isn't enough, for those who want the 15 minutes can go and have a break if they need to go to the toilet, get something to dream, get something to eat, that's fine. Do you mind answering a couple oh, more questions sure. during break time? Yep, that's fine. Okay, well in that case, um, we'll continue on. <laughs> And by the way, at five o'clock we have Natasha Vita Moore's presentation. We have a question. I'll bring it up later. All right. Um, hi. Okay. Yes. Um, so I've got a question about the early early part of your talk when you enumerated these various um, uh, themes that all stories fall into. Um, I'm wondering. Well, uh, how, how solid that conclusion really is, or whether it's just that these are the things that all commercially successful stories fall into because they uh, b b b because people write things that way in order to hitchhike on things that have previously been commercially successful. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, fair question. Um, it may have seemed to be a um, a framework driven by commercial success in stories because of the examples I was showing. Actually, that's not where it comes from. That framework was derived by, um, by data from, um, data origin data, from uh, having worked with um, groups in the 1960s and 70s at the, at the sort of outset of the field. So it was actually derived empirically from 
the variety of stories um, that, that he found them telling, and you know, and that you can see in, in any form. I, I don't think commercial success is is necessarily a um, kind of particular constraint on on the set that it comes from. Whether or not it's a it's an it's an adequate or fully definitive typology, I, I wonder that myself. You know, some people think that steady state um, is uh, is a fifth category. Um, you could see that as being subsumed under discipline or not, depending on how you look at it. But the point is, you know, more that uh, I think that the, the, the appropriate comparator is not perfection, but um, but the lack of a tool that, which is what most of us labour under most of the time. You know, this this kind of undifferentiated mass of of uh, stories, ideas half-formed thoughts about the future and I've just introduced this you know kind of as one way of bringing some order to that chaos um, there are plenty of others and there are plenty of, of others um, if I didn't say it during the talk then I can say it now there are a lot of other protocols for generating scenarios um, but that one is quite the four image four archetypal images is quite useful because you can um, apply it both in classifying mode and in a generative mode, and in that sense, I think it's quite a powerful starting point. Thanks for the question. Uh, excuse me, I was wondering if you um, considered using second life to model the future, maybe third life. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks. I have actually considered that, and it's. Um, I'm glad you asked the question because I think I've got a fairly succinct way of saying why that isn't very interesting to me. I mean, interesting for me to do. I'm, I'm interested in what other people might want to do. Basically, um, second life is sort of a low fidelity but large scale type of simulation. By low fidelity, I mean it doesn't resemble particularly, you know, the texture and vividness of actual life. I'm, I'm not criticizing it, I'm just saying, you know, it's kind of chunky and it's a computer um, setting and all of that. And it's good for certain things. The thing that I'm most interested in, and that these examples that I've given I think are driving at, is high fidelity and small scale. And by high fidelity, I mean actually evocative of moments in life. Um, so it's, it's like, you know, if I wanted to mock up a city and sort of do, or, or a building, um, and do a, a spatial simulation to just sort of figure out where everything is. Something like Second Life would be very handy. I have a colleague in London who uses uh, game engines to model unbuilt buildings, you know, um, within our company, uh, and perfect the wayfinding systems within them. So the signage, so you can find your way around the building and, and see how things will actually look, you know, before it's built. That's a great thing for that type of simulation to uh, to be used for. But the, the sorts of, um, when I talk about experiential scenarios, I suppose I'm most interested in, in moments, even if they only last seconds, moments that feel like actual inhabitation of, of a different place and time. And, um, and there are, there's other really great work that I didn't show because I wasn't involved in it, and so I can't speak to it as, as directly. Um, but, that's, that's the reason. I'm sort of more interested in that, um, in the lived experience, and then scaling it up from there, rather than sort of, you know, capturing the whole lot, um, but in a very sketchy way. Other people do that better. Over here. Um, I found it interesting how you're using the, um, uh, planting the experiential stories uh, as a form of intervention to start conversations. Um, have there been any studies like using that technique to see if it uh, was possible to kind of uh, change short-term futures from what you thought was probable to what you what was preferable. Do you mean have there been any studies to see uh, what impact those have on people? Yes. Um, well, I have to say that, that that I haven't done those studies because um, the the examples that I showed you were, were I think without exception all pretty um, under-resourced, and just getting them done was the challenge, uh, which means that evaluating, which is a super important phase of the process, um, I think is still kind of underdone on that front. But uh, I mean, my, my doctoral thesis was about 
this work, uh, and it's online. It's, um, it's called The Futures of Everyday Life. And um, part one of the kind of the pillars for the work is um, psychological theories about, um, about uh, cognitive biases and heuristics, which this work is in a way intended deliberately to exploit. Um, so the more concrete and specific you make a, um, make a proposition about the future, the more subjectively likely people rate it as being. Um, so the, there's a, a, a book out by Dan McKinnon, who's a Nobel Prize winning uh, behavioral economist, um, who with Amos Tversky in 1983 did an experiment um, about anchoring, sorry, about, about availability, which, um, which in a nutshell is, the example is um, two questions. How likely um, it would you rate, um, and I'm paraphrasing and probably mangling this, but you'll get the point, I hope. Um, how likely is it that a, um, a flood in California will kill a thousand people next year? So that's like question one. And then question two is, uh, or condition two with a different set of people is, how likely is it that an earthquake will happen triggering a flood which kills a thousand people? And the interesting thing is that the people exposed to question two rated as more likely than people ask question one, even though logically an earthquake causing a flood that kills people is less likely than a flood happening due to any reason um, and killing those people. It's kind of a grim uh, example, but the point, yeah, the point is that, that the specificity of the hypothetical makes it more available to people, and that's why they rate it as, as more likely. Um, so there is a, uh, I, I think, a deliberate exploit of that quirk of our minds by making something concretely available to people um, but it has a it has a weird impact in oh, sorry there's, there's something philosophically odd about that because it means that um, the more concretely you sort of manifest it the more likely it seems and yet the less likely it actually is objectively and I, I don't I mean that seems to me to actually be just a theoretical problem because we don't have any difficulty watching a movie and understanding that it is hypothetical space we're talking about rather than, you know, documentary. Or well, most of us don't have difficulty with that. So, do you think it changed the chance of um, the corp corporations becoming governors of um, Hawaii? <laughs> well, the, the point of, of um, the point of showing multiple kind of mutually exclusive. Um, scenaric states is precisely that it generates a cognitive dissonance. I mean, it's like the world could look like this, or this, or this, or this, but it can't look like all of them. I mean, you know, this, in, it can't look like all of them at once um, in that one place. And so by, by pegging out what I sort of call the four corners of possibility space, you're basically um, requiring some sort of negotiation with, with those array of potentials. And you know, that, that is the basis for action. That's why the fourth D is designed. Um, because once you've engaged with um, futures that are different, diverse, and deep, then you have a, a, a basis for choosing among alternative pathways into them. <coughs> I've just been asked to ask the question from over here, and if anyone else wants okay. a question to sort of uh, line up and take my phone behind me. Um, my question was, uh, you've sort of contextualized uh, this futurism as uh, about stories. Uh, how do you just see it as being uh, distinguished from the sort of rich culture of stories that we already have in both sort of narrative fiction, literature, film, which often have a very rich sort of view of the future? Yep. Yeah, um, well, so the, I guess the point is to hybrid, to hybridize or marry the, the uh, the rich traditions of storytelling and of, you know, which are filmic and theatrical and literary and, you know, comic and, uh, and other, um, with this sort of, the, the rigor that a structured approach to, to identifying relevant scenarios can bring. So the, the, the main sort of issue at the moment seems to be that when futures are done for serious purposes, you know, by organizations like IPCC, they're done in an extremely cautious and basically almost anti-narrative way. It's like they don't want to, um, to 
talk about the specifics because it wouldn't be scientific to do that. And it wouldn't. That's a limitation of science. You know, um, that's w w why we need to legitimate the, the, um, the use of imagination in public discourse, because otherwise you have the imaginative discussion happening over here, the political discussion happening over there. The connections, people will make them anyway. I mean, with, with our, our thinking about the future is still populated by the, um, by the ideas about the future we encounter in, in those cultural artifacts. But I don't think we you know, should be embarrassed about the fact that that's how our minds work. <laughs> Um, I just want to ask, uh, is there a movie that best represents your preferred vision of the near future? And a movie that represents what you think is likely to happen? Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> there are well-made movies, you know. Yeah. Um, actually, even though I, I abhor the scenario that it depicts Children of Men is a masterpiece of filmmaking, I think. Um, but no, I, if, if we confine ourselves to, to Hollywood story, I mean, as Aubrey was suggesting, that's really a pretty limited palette. Um, but the fact that, that vivid representations of possible worlds are coming down in price, and people can, you know, basically with a laptop and a bit of skill in CGI can mock up uh, fragments of possible worlds, like Neil Blomkamp, who made District 9, which is an amazing film as well, although again, you know, not necessarily a, a world you'd want to live in, but a really, really great piece of filmmaking. If you look online for the, for the short films that he made, that basically made his name as a, as a filmmaker, um, I think that sort of makes, to me, the, the really interesting... It, it proves the more interesting point here, which is the democratization of, um, of manifestation of, of imaginary worlds. That's the future that I'm interested in. Well, I mean, more so than a particular story about the future, a particular direction. I suppose um, my commitment is to the uh, spreading of the tools, you know, the mental time machine. That's what I'm most interested in. And, and in a way, I guess there's a sort of procedural article of faith there that if we if we get better at thinking about the future then we'll make better decisions about it too. It's it's a parallel um, commitment to that of democracy, which you know I don't think exists at, at a national level anywhere uh, in the world. But the general idea is that if you are synthesizing the wills of people and those, you know, and that they're knowledgeable and they're um, uh, thinking things through uh, and they're not under undue pressure and they're, and they're acting in good faith, then you'll get better decisions than, um, than you know, with the limited viewpoint of an oligarchy or a dictator. Uh, we have to... <laughs> yeah. or, I can, or I can schedule my talk for later, I don't know. Okay. We done? Hi. Congratulations.